Hey everybody, welcome to your video on your game to memorize. This is Botvinnik Capablanca. Um, one of Botvinnik's best games, one of the best games of, uh, of all time. Um, I think what makes this game really beautiful to me is that it's a clash of two geniuses. It's not genius versus roadkill you know, or world champion versus NN or anything like that. Um, it's a clash between two geniuses. And so you see the level of ideas from both sides is really great. And uh, what the strategy which Capablanca uses in this game as black, it doesn't work out. If you just show it to a computer or a modern super GM, they might look at it and say, uh, Black's play, well, if it were a super GM nowadays, they might say Black's play looks wrong. If they were a supercomputer, they would say, this move loses, stupid. Um, but what I want to remember and recapture with this is that what Capablanca played could have worked, you know, with one or two details different. And because what he did threatens to work, could work, has a great idea behind it. He forces Botvinnik to come up with something more brilliant and very precise in order to refute it. If that makes sense. So let's get into the game. I'm going to play, play through to a critical point very, very quickly and show you what this game is so exciting and thrilling for. We're going to do three stops here. The first stop is going to be what makes this game thrilling and exciting? Botvinnik's concept towards the end. The second thing we're going to look at is going to be where was the critical moment, in my opinion, where the game turns in Botvinnik's favor. And then the third thing we'll do is we'll go through all the moves a little bit my move by move to help you out a little bit with the memorization of the game. All right, so here we go. Uh, it's a Nimzo Indian. Potfinnick plays e3, but then immediately plays a3, forcing the bishop for doubled pawns and time. Uh, Capo played c5, and then he immediately trades in order to put the bishop here. Um, um, I think castles. 92, b6, castles. Bishop a6 trades and bishop b2. Double check. Yep, that's right. Queen d7. I think before he plays queen d3, actually he goes a4, rook e8. Yeah. Okay, a4, rook e8. Got it from here. Queen d3. c4. Here, black begins the maneuver of the knight. Knight here. Rook here. Knight here. Knight here. Knight here. F3. Knight B3. E4. And black calmly completes the plan. Winning this pawn over here. E5. Gaining space towards the king side. Uh, now, bot, now Kappa erects his defense, blocking f5, which is how white would normally take over the king side. Unleash the deluge. Trade. Trade. Now he looks to open the f file. Takes. Takes. Counters the e file. All right. So here's where I want to pick up this game for you, the first spot in the game. So... Black is up a pawn. White is trying to stir up trouble on the king side while black's queen and knight are far away. Now, let's say white's bishop is also currently far away, but it's a longer range piece than the knight. So there are potentially some ways the bishop could get back before the knight in some lines. That's definitely going to come up. The queen's a long range piece, so she can get back pretty quickly, right? Um, so time is really of the essence. White's looking 
to do something to the black king before the queen gets back. Black also has a pawn minority on the king side. So white can weaken the king with pawn trades like, you know, just happened with e takes f6, right? And then looking for another one with f5. So white's looking to, you know, mildly denude the king, remove pawn cover, break through on this file with the queen. Black, for his part, is trying to trade off all the rooks. And you can see that once these rooks are gone and this queen comes back to the king side, that it doesn't look like there's enough on the board for white to have an attack against the black king, right? So imagine um, a scenario like rook takes e8, um, queen taking on e8, pawn taking on g6, and queen taking on g6, or something like this position here, right? Are there huge prospects of a mating attack against the black king? No. I mean, does white have some play still? Sure, the knight's weirdly placed, right? And the black king isn't well covered. Certainly, you could always defend this endgame down a pawn trying to draw. No problem. Very plausible. Um, but it doesn't look terrifying from black, right? That's all I want to say. It's, and I didn't play precise moves in this variation. Just want to give you a scenario and say, look, this is not terrifying, right? You don't expect blacks about to get made in this kind of scenario. So that's black's concept trade off all the rooks um, and bring the queen back. And then, yes, the king may be exposed. Yes, white's going to have drawing chances in a lot of scenarios. But effectively, there will be no mating attack, no real danger of black losing, and black has the inevitability of these two pawns on the queen side for white to contend with, right? Okay, so a, a great defensive concept from uh capablanca and it started here with this move g6 the only way to stop white from playing f4 f5 that i can see is first you play g6 defending the f5 square and then when white plays f4 you play f5 and the knight isn't able to take it well it would have to be a sack and i checked it and the sack doesn't work <laughs> okay so that's the concept and when white trades black takes back and the knight supports the e8 square, and blacks are just looking to trade off uh, pieces and suck out uh, whites, the, uh, the material needed for white to really have an attack. So there's a lot of pressure on white here, and there's only one great move, but Botvinnik had planned for it, and it is this move. And this is the move that really electrifies me with this game is using this sort of support point on the contested file. Obviously, you know, any experienced player, which anyone in this 1900 to 2000 FIDE cohort would be, any experienced player has seen rooks, you know, contest an open file before. And we all know that both players would like to control that file. We've all seen moves like rook to e5 using a support point on that file right to try and say hey if you take then i get this kind of thing rolling um change the pawn structure favorably but this one here when this pawn itself is sort of under attack and it's not part of a solid pawn structure um where if the trade happens the pawn won't be defended on e6 it'll be isolated and you know potentially in danger of being lost itself this move here was still a big revelation to me really opened my eyes strategically to oh you could do that you know very very dynamic of course you can't take out the support point of the rook because the rook is also threatening to clean up the knight right so actually the support point holds just just long enough um i suppose there could be a question of what would happen if black just tried to come defend the knight with the king right my assumption would be that we could sack on f6, but I haven't verified that at all. But let's just play a couple moves because this question only came to me now. Um, but I would say we'd go here. There's a threat of queen f7 check with continuing attack. So we'd expect the king to take. Let's throw in a check. And then let's just look at this position and see if white has anything here or not. Like, was this the right idea at all? guess there's one more check 
see a check, give a check. If the king comes back, there's queen f6 to g7 mate. If the king comes this square way, queen g5 to f6 to g7 mate. So the king has to come forward. And now you could play either h4 with queen g5 mate as your threat or g4 with queen f6 mate as your threat. Queen here could cover that checkmate. Maybe this one's better. There's rook g8 could cover that one. Knight better not move with this around. Um, this looks probably good for white. There's also knight f6 as a move, looking at queen h7 and the rook. This is probably good for white, but I'm not completely confident of how to do it like h4 rook g8 g4 queen c6 covering the checkmate from here and i don't see it oh when the queen moves the bishop can move maybe we can stretch the defenses with bishop f8 here Sorry, I didn't have this variation planned. And then it just struck me as a good question. I've already answered like 500 questions about this game for myself. Um, so let me back up for a second and tell you what this question even is. I think this was probably good. You know, you could go like queen e8, but the defenses are heavily stretched. Check forcing the king to fill the blocking square. Right? And then mate. Okay, so anyway, here's the question. White plays rook e6. It threatens the knight. In the game, black traded off the rook, and we get this controversial isolated pawn. If black defends the knight, can white sack to open up an immediate mating attack? And my instincts tell me, like, strong yes, that this should be... that this should be good. Um, with either g4 or h4 here, or both. Or, or either. Like, both might work. Um, so, yeah, that's 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 kind of that question. I think that's probably true. So, rook e6. Um, black takes, and now we're going to follow a few more moves because rook e6 is still controversial. The queen tags the knight, which can't afford to move anything like this because of queen f7, and then checkmate. So rook e6, f e6, black's going to have to defend the knight. Black played king to g7, and now botfinex follow-up is queen f4. Hitting a bunch of spots, black's got some weak dark squares. To stop f4, f5, black had to put pawns on light squares. Very dangerous with white having the dark squared bishop. So here, there may be a threat of queen c7, move the king, queen f7, disrupting the knight, and then the pawn comes. But the number one threat here that I know of is knight f5. I know it because I know that would just end the game. So we can demonstrate the idea very briefly with a move that Kappa did not play. Knight f5 check, pawn takes, queen g5, pushing the king, right? Taking here. And then the resulting position, whichever direction the king goes, you're going to be able to play queen f7 and e7, and the pawn will be un stoppable i guess if i go this way there's checkmate on f8 so i'll go this way here 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 and the black king gets pushed off of the defense of e8 right if you move away the pawn can queen if you block your queen the pawn can queen so white breaks through and, and wins with the e-pawn right so knight f5 huge threat tactic to break through with the queen and then the pawn will go all the way so what black um has to do here is they have to protect the king and they have to keep this pawn from queening. So, um, Kappa brought the queen back, dealing with this pawn. And uh, it both deals with the pawn and deals with the knight f5 check threat because of queen g6, saving the knight. Very important. So, the sack is off. So, Bodvinik simply improved the queen here with queen e5. And 
one may wonder what he's even threatening in this position. Um, like if black played, you know, b5 or a6 or something like that. And I think what he would do is he would probably play bishop a3, improving the bishop and preparing to really control the e7 square. Um, and also with the bishop on a3, you have the idea of bringing the bishop to uh, d6 at some point, switching the queen and bringing the bishop to e5. With the bishop on a3, you can also give a queen check on c7, uh, force the king back, and then come into e7 with the bishop to unseat this knight. So there's several angles of how white can improve the position, but it would generally start with bishop a3 if black did a real passing move, you know, an a6 or a b5 or an a5 kind of move. I think it's improve the bishop, and then, you know, some ideas around queen c7 or bishop d6, continuing to improve that bishop. The bishop, if it could just come to c1, would probably be very powerful. For now, the knight's stopping that. But basically, the idea is black's position is creaking. The queen and knight are barely holding off your queen and knight with this pawn stopping mating attacks. And these pieces have to not only defend the king, but keep this e-pawn from queening. The e-pawn itself is so close to the king, it's an extra attacker. If this bishop could add to the king side before the knight, black would be kind of dead. So Kappa holds firm the blockade, covers queen c7, and covers bishop a3. Logical. Um, another plan suggested by chat, by the way, if white just wanted to improve their position from here, would be h4, h5, poking at the king's pawn cover a little bit more. Threats of h6 check would come up tactically. So that could also be a nice way for white to improve the position a little bit. And actually last night, I'd been studying this game so much that last night I was dreaming a bunch of variations and they looked like, I'll just show you one so I can show you that I was actually dreaming about h4, h5. h6, h4, um, then what did I have? I had like queen e7 stopping bishop a3, h5, knight starts to come back. Wait, what was my variation? This was not my variation. Because here it just takes. Dream variations aren't always accurate, so there could be something wrong with it. What was my variation? Here, here, here. The timing's just not quite working out here, here. Nope, that's not it either. My dream variation makes no sense. I can't set it up for y'all. <laughs> Somehow in my dream variation, black doodles around for a little bit. White gets the pawn all the way here. And in my dream, when black plays h6, white wins with pawn takes pawn, leaving the bishop hanging. I don't know. Okay, this dream variation was no good. But you get control of knight f5. And if pawn takes bishop, you have knight f5 winning the queen. If king takes, you check, forcing the king here. Then you take here, here here and here now also in my dreams for some reason i spent half an hour calculating the fastest checkmate for white with queen knight and pawn against nothing which is pointless since black doesn't have a queen but i like i chased this king around in circles with my queen and knight in my dreams for like 20 minutes it was really stupid okay i'm sorry for putting that trash in your video my apologies <laughs> my apologies to all of you back to the real brilliance of botvinik rather than the deluded dreams <laughs> of david um so in this position queen e7 played stopping queen c7 stopping the pawn from advancing and stopping the bishop from coming to a3 um to sort of improve the bishop through d6 or e7 etc and Botfinik, in response, played bishop a3 anyway. And this is the move the game's most famous for. For me, rookie six is even more electrifying, but this is the second electrocution uh, that occurs in this game here for Kappa. And this move, well, I mean, if the queen backs up, then, you know, white's winning because they're bringing the bishop into the game so quickly. So, uh, so Kappa took, as he's 
sort of more or less forced to at this point. And, but of course it doesn't matter because white has a force win here as well. Uh, and it is knight to h5. That, that's brutal. That is just brutal. <laughs> On the square that seems to be so controlled as well, right? And then after takes, gives the check. Um, king, I, I forget if he went to f8 or h8. Shoot, it doesn't matter at all. But now I'm forgetting. Mm, I, I'll just check. I was going to say king f8, which is correct. Now here, are, you know, I thought queen f7, king here, e7, but in the game, Bonfinic just plays e7 without throwing in the queen check. Um, and here, black is helpless against queen f8. So the sacrifice was, in fact, winning. Okay, there, there ensued some checks which I'll show you later. But for now, let's just recap the brilliancy of this. In this position, black has a concept to hold the king side together, trade off enough pieces, bring the queen back, and then threaten to win with the queen side pawns. Bofinik has found the only idea that can win for white, this unstable rook on e6, correctly assessing that in this position, he's got enough dynamics and energy that this e6 pawn will be an asset rather than a weakness. The knight was defended. He brings the queen. The opponent's queen retreats to defend the area. And then the buried bishop on b2. Reviled. Look at this poor piece. Reviled throughout the game. And throughout, you know, throughout uh, people's conception discussion of chess strategy in the previous 10 to 20 years before this game was played. Uh, this would have been considered an absolute trash bishop on b2. It electrifies from a3, setting up the combination, and then the pawn beats the actually terrible knight in the endgame. One pawn versus one knight. So that's the brilliant conception from Botvinnik that, uh, that wins this game and, you know, expands our imagination and our understanding of what chess can be, right? Now an interesting and now an important part of this whole game and the whole discussion around what's going on with this situation is which of these pieces was worse throughout the game, right? Because this is a knight on a light square dominating a dark square bishop, it's on an outpost, it's defended. But Bovnik shows that the value of the piece depends on the context, right? If it were a game about winning an endgame, black would be winning. If it were a game about, you know, something happening on the queen side, black would be winning. But it's a game about attacking on the king side, and the knight on b3 ends up being even worse than this sort of famously terrible looking bishop on b2. That's like a huge piece of what's, uh, of what's going on here. Now I'm going to take you to the moment which I think kind of decides the game. We're going to go right here. Here's where I think that Capablanca goes off track. And now, again, full respect, you know, prior to this game, nobody could know that this plan of going to b3 and queen a4 wouldn't be good enough. And it also depends very heavily on specific tempi and details in the position. In some other position, uh, you know, where black already has a pawn on g6 or something and white spent a move on king h1, this might be a winning plan for black, for all we know. Um, or a plan to get a slight edge that puts pressure on white, let's say. But within the context of this game, we have now learned that this maneuver of the knight to b3 is too slow and white gains the advantage with the kingside push. So what should black do in this position? Well, what black should do is avoid the f3, e4 plan and wait on any plans of attacking a4, trying to prove black's advantage on the queen side where black could eventually make a pass pawn and has space from the c pawn, right? But, um, but first black needs to play preventatively against the e4 push and the cleanest and only good move, it turns out here, is knight e4. I spent like an hour on this, so I'm pretty, pretty confident. This is the one and only correct way to stop f3 e4 um if white plays f3 anyway you always have to ask yourself did you actually prevent it right they make the trade they're still looking to play e4 now we play 
f5, very, very important move, defended by the queen, right, and controlling e4. And the point is that now if white plays e4, after we trade some stuff, uh, potentially the rooks as well right here, white's left with doubled isolated g-pawns in a slightly weird king position, right? White doesn't have a pawn majority attacking the black king. They've got a passed um, d-pawn in the center. And some pieces are coming off the board, and the black's king isn't weakened. They haven't spent a move on g6. There's no real attack against the black king. And this position is um, like fully acceptable, basically, for either for either side, I would say. You know, you get some position like this, and put your rook over here, and the game just, you know, the game just plays. No, no clear upper hand for white or black yet. So that would be one version of knight e4. Um, another thing white can do is avoid the knight trade to threaten f3, and then we would play a real super GM move. We would just bounce back with the knight so that f3 fails to rook e3. And on knight g3, we just come back again. We can shake hands and get paid. Okay, so that is my major conceptual improvement on how to play this uh, game as black. Um, and it's right here to stop this e4 move and to not think that you have enough time for this knight a5 to b3 maneuver. Once Kappa starts on that maneuver, I think this position is very bad for black in many ways. I've looked at different options. I've seen some suggestions of, you know, one move might have been a little better or worse later on in the game. But I think fundamentally, if you want to ask the strategic current of the game, this knight on b3 is lost as far as action on the king side. And Bofinik has enough strength on the king side that he can always force action there. So I would call this position straight up bad for black after allowing f3 e4 and maneuvering the knight to b3 so to me that's the turning point of the game now our third stop is to go through the full game just talk a little bit about everything that happens in it okay so first of all you can remember the first chunk as it being the nimzo indian botfinic plays e3 d5 and then a3 um a sort of clunky move order, especially as far as this bishop is concerned. I don't think you'll find modern games being played in this position anymore. Um, you know, if somebody plays e3, it's often not to play a3, but to sort of develop the king side and let what, you know, leave this situation sort of dangling for the moment. Um, but to now spend a tempo on a3... Uh, to take the dark squared bishop with this bishop super buried by the moves a3 and e3 um, is, is not an obvious or, or a modern concept. But let's give Botvin a credit for this. Like at the time, this would have been thought to be a pretty bad bishop and sort of a pretty dumb plotting move order for white. But he had, even though it's now superseded by today's conceptions, of opening theory, he had a concept behind it. And you'll see him plunk this bishop on b2 a few moves later and think like, oh my god, like what what was he thinking? But he was thinking something. He had he had an idea. He had a plan to eventually play a4 and bring the bishop out. He also had a plan to just make this d4 pawn really, really solid and eventually play f3 e4, which is like a big plan that that Botfinick in some positions pioneered for us. I think including in the normal Carlsbad Queen's Gambit pawn structure, like these pawn structures here, I think Botfinick was one of the people to whom we owe the F3 E4 plan in these positions. And uh, you know, you can see a similar idea in this game. Now, as soon as Kappa, Kappa, instead of castling, challenges him in the center immediately, and Botfinick immediately makes the trade on D5, uh, releasing this bishop but also allowing him to play bishop d3 without potentially losing a tempo. Um, if You can also play bishop d3 as white, and, uh, you know, it just leads to... It just leads to another kind of game. Black will usually trade and then play queen c7. Uh, and you have to cover the, the c3 slash c4 squares 
here is white. So I think, um, you know, it's just another game. It's another option. Um, some people have played this. I don't think it's unplayable for white. It's just not the choice Botvinnik made on this day. But he made the trade on d5, ed5, and then develops his bishop to d3. Now, you guys may remember structurally and conceptual already that at some point in the game, Kappa plays c4, but before he does that, he's going to trade the bishop. But before you play a fancy maneuver like b6, bishop a6, you need to castle because there's always going to be queen a4 check. So that's how you can remember the move order here that he castled next instead of starting the light square bishop trade plan, right? So imagine b6. You guys know that Botvinnik's knight ended up on e2 this game because it was out of the way of f3, e4, right? So you know he plays with knight e2 after the bishop comes out. And now bishop a6. And hopefully you have... The logical thinking to realize this could not be the move order of the game right so that brings you back here you know cop is going to play b6 bishop a6 so clearly he had to castle first botfinex is going to develop now we're going to get b6 you know that he doesn't try and finagle out of it he allows it and just gladly trades off his light squared bishop and leaves himself without the bishop pair and with this dud on uh, d2 of course um you know, you could also consider a move like bishop c2. Um, cause you'll, that way you'll have to play rook e1 and knight g3. Um, he also has the option of playing knight to g3 and letting the trade happen on d3. And then the black knight will come here in one move instead of going knight a6, knight b8. I think the tempo, the tempes, the tempe, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that's embarrassing. I think the tempe will come out. Uh, about the same regardless i don't see a real advantage like trading obviously white gets a tempo but if white trades they also get the tempo because queen d3 knight b8 knight c6 etc so i don't think that would make any big difference but in this game you guys know that botfnik does trade and at some point plays queen d3 hitting the knight but you also know that when he plays queen d3 cop is going to answer with c4 with tempo um so we know that he doesn't play uh queen d3 just yet he's first gonna play bishop b2 and a4 and it's a weird move order i had this position in a blitz game just like two days ago actually <laughs> while i was studying the bop in a game i had this position and i was playing you know i was yeah I tried to play the Botfinic e3, a3 on purpose, and then I was playing kind of like a dummy. But the idea that made sense to me was a4, bishop a3, right? And also the idea to maybe poke with a5 really quickly. Um, if you can ever trade your a pawn, by the way, for one of these pawns, your disadvantage on the queen side pretty much goes away because then you don't have an isolated pawn they can target, and they have a pawn that's weak on one of these two files that your rooks can attack. So if you can ever make that trade, it's great. Black's usually going to want to avoid it with b5. If you try and push a5 if you try and push a5 so for me it was like a4 bishop a3 would make the most sense you know if black trades or pushes the bishop's going to become good if black tries to hold the line on c7 then they're not clamping our light squares and there's tension and our bishops involved and blah 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 um in my game somehow my opponent got control of the c file really quickly and i struggled a little bit um but anyway, that would be sort of my stereotype way to do it. And Botfinic just happily plops this, this thing right here. It looks like, oh, God. Oh, God. But I think what he wants to do, actually, is uh, something mentioned in chat, which is I think he's thinking of playing for C4. Um, so his concept, if I can guess and put into words what Botfinic's seeing strategically... He's thinking that he wants to play like queen d3, poke the knight, it retreats, he plays c4. Explode the whole center, and then be left with a nice bishop on b2. Um, and, you know, maybe a small edge in the technical position that comes from that. The bishop on b2 could threaten to become very good, right? Because white's got knight g3, f5 to go after this complex. Um, white also has a pawn majority on the king side, so there are plans of going e4 uh in the middle game once you've traded all four of these pawns and then the second half of his plan is like 
if he goes queen d3 and black plays c4 to prevent him from playing c4, then he will go for the f3 e4 plan once black can't open the c file anymore. So he'll have a free hand with a tensionless center to build towards the king side. I think that's his concept and it's not easily you know, refuted or stopped. All right, black puts their queen on light squares after the light squared bishops are traded. That's where this queen's going to have the most influence and there's a lot of key weak squares here. White plays a4. Black's going to get the rook off of bishop a3 while controlling uh, the most important square on the board, I think, from black's perspective. It's this one. You could also potentially argue this, right? But these are the most important squares because we don't want to let these pawns move. Those are the pawns that hurt the bishop on, on b2 most. So now queen d3 comes from Botvinnik. And, you know, the choice to play c4 is, I guess we could say, controversial. You know, Botvinnik, I think, in some, I, think I read somewhere that Botvinnik said, so maybe it's not true because I don't remember reading Botvinnik's original comments on this game. But I think I saw somewhere that Botvinnik said queen b7 could be an alternative covering the knight. And in case of a5, of course, you always have b5. But this would specifically, you know, allow this c4 concept that white's playing for. And then the question is, you know, do the black rooks come into play well enough? Does the white queen have a good square to hide from the black rooks from knight b4 or knight c5? Um, can white set up everything they want to to start trying to get an edge here? I don't know exactly. And then there's the question of, you know, is c4 great because you can eventually win on the queen side or is it bad because you took the pressure off d4 and gave white a free hand with e4? My take is, like, essentially it's just an option. Um, I don't think it's necessarily better or worse by far than other play because as you guys know, I think that at the right moment, black could have stopped e4 from white. Okay. So, um, so after c4... He's going to drop the queen back to c2 where it covers the light squares. And note both people are going to want their queens ideally on light squares um, in this post-light squared bishop uh, board. Um, and now black starts this knight maneuver. Well, first of all, the knight's terrible on a6. So the first two moves of the knight maneuver I'm fine with. Knight b8 and white just vacates the queen side, right? Knight c6. Knight g3. Note that the move order is white can't play f3 at any point with the e pawn hanging. So if you're in this position here and you don't remember the move order that Botvinnik played, you basically have two options. Either he played knight g3, knight c6, rook a1, which rook a1, which would be fine, or rook a1, knight c6, knight g3. Whichever one you remember doesn't actually change the game too much, so it's not like a big deal if you can't remember the order exactly. Um, but he did bring the rook first, which is a little bit more flexible because the knight has some options of what it wants to do, and knight e4 right away is not an option because you'd play f3. Um, so rook a1 is just a little bit better and more flexible than the knight move, and Botvinnik played the better move. He knows where he wants the rooks, right? This is the plan. Um, knight c6 was still fine from Kappa, as I said, and knight g3, and now you have to stop f3, e4. Just, just have to. And um, I, I just, I don't think there's any, any other option for black that is, you know, very, very good here. Any other option, white should at least get a small edge. Like, it would be logical as well to maybe put the rooks on light squares fighting for this area here, right? But what you'll see is white can still play e4. One, two, three, four... One, two, three, four. And once you've counted to four, you can confidently say that black's worse, okay? David tells you you can stop right there. So um, so that's like one example. And I guess the other option would be instead of knight a5 to here, you could go for some kind of b5 plan while white plays f3, e4. Again, I think you'd be a bit worse. So, uh, well, definitely worse. So let's just say f3, e4 is an existential threat. It's significant. It may not win the game, but it's going to establish an advantage of noticeable proportions. And knight e4 was the way to deal with it. In the game, do you already remember what Kappa's choice was? Like, have we laid out the strategy and the structure well enough that you've already got it? He's going to bring the knight to b3, right? So knight a5, f3, knight b3, e4. 
now Kappa just goes ahead with grabbing the pawn. By the way, there's basically never a threat to take on d5. The knight on d5 is so good that there's almost no position that's playable for white with taking on d5. Um, so white's going to give up light squares to gain space, right, with e5. And, of course, the plan is to play f4, f5, and, you know, regain control of light squares at some point. But he's going to grab the space. The knight's going to retreat. And here is a move that I need to tell you something about to help you remember what he played. Because mm, maybe the most obvious move here would be just to roll the pawns, right? And another move you might consider might be queen f5. I think probably queen a5 is queen f5 is playable probably right you know if queen e2 trying to trap queen a2 oh he's saying the next square i'm thinking about if queen a2 trying to trap the bishop rook e2 which is defended is solid enough um as well as queen a2 queen d7 queen b2 queen d5 might be controversial i don't suggest that i think you would keep your bishop okay but why didn't he simply play f4? It's, to some extent, the most obvious move. The first move you would look at, I think, any master player. And uh, and it turns out it's also very good. But my explanation is that Botfinnick considered the knight on b3 to already be a bad piece. He already has this concept, I'm going to attack the king's side. This knight is just not going to be able to get there. So what he probably did not want to allow was the move knight c5 a tactic because the queen's undefended you can't take on c5 without hanging c2 if you take on a4 the knight gets out once queens are off the board by the way black's generally winning most scenarios um at least way 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 better so he didn't want to allow this move right it's a tactic now you have to move your queen somewhere um which could be f5 or e2 or or whatever um you know let's go to f5 for and then the knight from b3 becomes the knight on d3. Now I looked at this a little bit with the computer and it said white's still winning. It doesn't matter. You just move the rook out of the way. I wanted to sack the exchange. I was wrong about that. White's attack is not so fast moving that they should sack the exchange. You just play rook e2. And even with the knight on b3 coming to, to, to d3, this is still a winning position from white who's going to move the queen back and play f5 and sort of dominate the position anyway. Okay, but what you need to remember is the reason, right, that he moves the queen out of the way. He doesn't want to allow knight c5 to d3. And if you were in a game, I mean, I think 100 out of 100 players would avoid this knight c5 move if they saw it <laughs> coming. So that's why Bopnik plays this fine move, queen f2. There's nothing wrong with either move, by the way. It turns out, you know, f4 and queen f2 are, I would say, sort of, as far as I can tell, similarly winning for white. But that's the move already. Plays queen f2 to avoid knight c5. Now look at this position and, and see if you can remember Capablanca's defense. The threat from white is f4, f5. There's nothing you can do that really matters on the scale of that. Like b5, b4 comes to mind as, as a thing to do. Um, that would be maybe the most other impactful thing black could do. Um, but here Capablanca thought about f5 the way I think he should have thought about e4, right? When f3, e4 was in the offing, now f4, f5 is in the offing. And there he should have controlled e4. Here he tries to control f5 and block it. So his choice in the actual game is to go g6, f4, and then f5, blocking white from playing f5. Now this knight is held at bay from the king's side by black's pawn structure. This rook is blocked. The position's locked up, and white absolutely has to trade, as he does in the game, to get anything going, and that opens up the game for some rook trades for Kappa. Uh, so that was his defensive concept here, g6, f5. Let's have a quick look at um, b5, shall we, just to get a sense of, you know, is there anything black can do that matters enough in this kind of a position? Now, if you take on b4, I think you're helping black, because the queen takes back, getting control of c3, I'm sure you could defend c3, but why would we do that? Let's let black take and we recapture. So let's just keep playing the moves that you would expect white to play here. And now white's getting ready for e6 or f6 or knight h5 is, is the move that I would most have my eye on next. Um, 
And I learned while analyzing that sometimes instead of checkmating black with the knight on h5, you suddenly come back to f4, you know, queen f3 and win the d5 pawn and black's position collapses in the center. So let's keep our eyes on that. Like when you see this, you're thinking checkmate, but I learned something else uh, when I checked some of my analysis with the computer. So if black takes, bishop takes, it's hard to get this thing going, right? We need to somehow attack this bishop, which means a knight on b5, which this one can't get to, this piece can't move. How do we get... How do we get through? You can move the queen out of the way and try and queen the A pawn. But I don't see how to break this blockade. I don't see how to attack it basically even once. And of course, white can easily support the bishop a little bit. And D4 is still well enough defended that it doesn't look like black's got meaningful pressure. You'd have to bring this knight to C6 and then attack D4 with your queen. It's hard to do. That's at least a four move maneuver. And then white could just play a move like rook D1 or something. And you'd be done with that source of counterplay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we can move we can move the queen back, make way for the a pawn, um, you know, maybe inch the queen up, play a five, put the knight here, maybe queen h six, queen h six loses to trades and push, and if the knight moves, there's well, which it will have to, there will be knight f six check. So that'll be winning for white. Um, go king h8, I guess. And you know, maybe e6. Takes, takes, rook takes, queen f7. Threatening checkmate on the rook. The rook defends both, then rook e8 should be back rank mate. So these are not exhaustive variations. I don't remember all the variations I looked at in the past. Um, this is just like a feeling for the position. You can see the b5, b4. It's a very, very slow plan to now queen the a pawn. b5, b4 itself didn't even add that much to the plan since we couldn't break either of these two squares. And uh, this is very, very imposing. Lots of different ideas and threats for white. Um, yeah, someone in chat is saying that f6 also should just work. So let's say black tries to not lose this pawn for free. Then you'd have queen here, rook here, and then what? A rook lift or a pawn breakthrough. Um, you know, there's like this knight f4, rook f3 check mating idea. Oh, but black does have knight f8. So maybe maybe e6 would be interesting, and then takes, and then push. And if the rook moves, you give checkmate, and if the rook doesn't move, you take it. Yeah, that's pretty interesting, from white's perspective only. From white's perspective only. Um, You know, you may think like, oh, exchange stack, white stack some pawns. We'll still have a game going here, but you have to realize that well, rook f7, maybe even better. But um, you have to realize that white's got two just absolutely raging rooks um, coming in, and the black king is is still open and available for attack. So this is going to be... It's not going to be an exchange stack. It's just going to be white continue, keeps going with the, with the destruction of black's king. So that's a little feeling about, you know, what could black do in this position that might matter compared to f4, f5? Too slow. Too slow to run the A pawn. Too slow to break the center. Um, so Kappa sets up G6 and F5, blocking it. Now, do you guys remember Bonifanik's concept for this position? There's only one way forward. We need to open the king. We can't go into a blockaded position. So he trades, the knight takes, and then he looks to open the F file, right? So now Kappa needs to suck energy off of the F file, right? Trade that rook off. It comes here. Trade the next rook off. I read some comments that said that rook f8 was a tougher defense in this position uh, for black. Um, but of course, I still believe in Botvinnik's position. Now he's got the file, so he's got rook e7. He's got the knight way off on b3. And he successfully you know, weakened this king's pawn cover a bit. So maybe this is tactically more stable, protecting the knight and you know, holding the position for the moment. But to me, it's uh, undeniable that, uh, that white has a strong looking position here, right? Maybe queen f4 to g5. 
could be next um or maybe even trading and then bringing the queen um i just believe i just believe in white's position anyway so i saw that move mentioned somewhere not going to give you any long variations kappa played rook e8 and if the if the rooks come off in general kappa is going to be fine except that botfinick has this idea in mind to put the f pawn on e6 just absolute sparkling brilliance um, the rooks were traded. We've gone over this part already, right? The knight needs to be defended. The queen threatens to come in. Queen e8. Queen e5. This time around, I'll mention one little note for all of you, which is that I believe queen c7 check was stronger. Oh, yeah, this is where my dream started. I was looking at queen c7 check being a little bit stronger. Chase the king back and then come to e5 with tempo. And you get a full extra move this way, right? And then um, I was playing. This is how I got my extra tempi for that for that dream line of mine, right? Where the pawn comes to h5, pokes here, bishop comes to g5. Um, so it's something like here, here, here. Even here, like the tempi are wrong somehow by one by one tempo. <laughs> I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> and in all my dreams. They're also looking for something more fancy than needed, right? Because in all these positions here, generally speaking, one way to gain a big advantage for white is just to win the d5 pawn and connect these two pawns. So everything I did was was unnecessary in my dreams. But, but, but it all comes from a true fact, which is there's one small inaccuracy from Botfinick in this game, so to speak, that queen c7 would be stronger just forcing the king back and winning a whole tempo when you come here to e5. Um, the knight can't, you know, go off because there's such a big deal when this, uh, when this d5 pawn collapses, right? Then white just has rolling pawns of doom. Okay. So anyway, we don't need to be belabor that too much, but queen c7 would have been nice. He played queen e5 instead, which is very good and has more of a tsugtsvangi feel. Now, last time we were here, we didn't talk too much about how, uh, Kappa could have tried to defend here. We just looked at queen e7 and you know the famous bishop a3 move in response when i first look at this position the most logical thing to me is try and bring this piece back but it's a bit slow and i came up with a cool move here bishop c1 knight coming back to c6 bishop h6 check king takes queen takes threatening knight f5 checkmate well king h5 queen h4 right but knight f5 is going to lead to checkmate here there's also king h5 knight g7 i mean it's just this is a, a game winning threat so knight e7 has to stop it now be careful not to go for fancy pantsy stuff like this right like thinking you're a genius the pawn's not pinned anymore <laughs> right but um i did find a really scintillating win anyway here with h4 this little h pawn adds the last ingredient we need to to basically create an unstoppable mating threat Notice the black knight can't move because the knight of five. Queen can't move because it's defending the knight. So black's just sort of frozen here. A5, check here. This was set up just to be able to get our knight past the g-pawn. That's what h4 was for. And now if king g8, knight f6. And if king to a different square, queen f6. So that was a cool little win that I found. And that made me feel like black's almost in Tsugtsvang in this position, right? Because like we want to bring the knight back, but if we move the knight back, we let the bishop go to c1. And that had this weird Tsugtsvang feel. And I'm like, what else are we going to do? Queen e7 allowed bishop a3, right? Moving the king allows queen takes knight. So there's not a lot <laughs> going for black in this position. Um, and apparently the best computery defense was considered to be h6 it's very very logical that this is the best defense because it's setting up on um, some control of the dark squares right it's preventing the bishop g5 idea because by the way if we do like da, 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 here for some reason i just want to show you that bishop g5 can also be generally a strong idea just in a very very simple way we can just take 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 and these positions are you know knights hanging knight goes here queen goes here or to d7 i don't know where or e4 whatever it may be the point is 
you know, now White's got the advantage in this endgame, right? They've got, they're up a pawn. The central pawns are kind of rolling a little bit. So, um, so the simple idea of bishop c1 to g5 can be, uh, can be quite strong as well. So I think the best defense that somebody came up with somewhere was this h6 move. And, um, and then it's not that easy to prove white's breakthrough from here. Um, so for what it's worth, I won't burden you all with a bunch of variations, but this is cool and instructive move that this move plays against, uh, that there's actually one mildly productive move for black in this near two tongue position. Every other move basically makes your position worse. Like a six or a five, I guess is not particularly worse, but doesn't help. H six mildly helps against these bishops. C one ideas. Um, so memorizing your game queen e7 boom takes it hopefully you guys can remember moves this flashy knight h5 takes check king f8 check here now the pawn solo beats the knight goes to e7 i would have played queen f7 and now i'll finally show you guys the checks that ended the game not that they matter but looks to give checks on the light squares and stuff here check here check takes the pawn gets checked don't block here because of queen h2 uh, that's probably immediately a draw if you ever block with your queen and trade queens black and play king f7 so you need the queen on the board for the pawn to win and then here there's this so um i don't know i don't know that that white can escape in that line. But the easiest was he came back after taking that pawn. Now there's no queen g4 mate. Queen checked him again, and now he blocked with the g pawn. And now the queen can't get to h2, so black runs out of checks, right? Okay. So um, that's Botvinik Kappa. Fantastic game, right? Incredible. Um, great concepts from both players. Kappa's concept of knight a5 to b3, overly optimistic. We would now suggest uh, that that was sort of like the key idea that was proved wrong in this game. Right here, knight a5. Instead, we're saying fight tooth and nail for that blockade on e4 at this point in the game. Um, but Kappa must have thought that Botfinix... Kappa must have been in an aggressive mood and thought Botfinex's play was not that impressive. You know, the bishop b2, this tempo for a4, just leaving the pawn kind of dangling out there. And so Kappa, you know, said, hey, I'm going to take that pawn and I'm going to defend. Um, and Botfinex demonstrated how strong the f3-4 plan was here. Uh, and, you know, played some brilliant, brilliant ideas to to demonstrate that to us um, that's it that's the game go show it to somebody else play over it a couple times check in next week and the week after if you still remember it show it to somebody else um you know if you want a little analysis assignment because i know you guys are are pretty advanced up here uh let me give you a little analysis assignment you could look at the position after h6. And uh, that's a pretty pretty open topic because I haven't given you much in terms of variations here. I mean, you know that there's an h4, h5 idea and an idea to improve the bishop. Um, but starting from that point, there's a lot of different variations you could have a look at. So um, if you, if you want to go a little deeper on one position, um, this could be a fun little uh, calculation analysis exercise to work on this position all right take care everybody good luck with your training hope you're enjoying everything so far and i'll see you around the dojo